Skeletal Muscle 2.0. This is the Corona Summer. I am Matt Halter. And let's get into more detail on muscle contraction. So we talked about basically everything in this slide here in the previous video was a different image, but this is showing the same concepts where we have a somatic motor neuron releasing its signaling molecule, acetylcholine binding to the nicotinic channel, ultimately causing the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, binding to troponin, one of the regulatory proteins, and allowing for muscle contraction. So what I'm showing in this slide are three different things. This top graph is the action potential of a neuron, which takes about one to two milliseconds. The middle graph is the action potential for a skeletal muscle fiber. It's the action potential for a skeletal muscle fiber. And the last one is what's known as a muscle twitch. So a twitch is a muscle contraction relaxation cycle. So this parabola right here represents the twitch. The first half of it is a contraction phase. The second half of it's the relaxation phase. And one significant thing to see in this graph, right, there is a time lag or delay between the initial depolarization or excitation of the muscle fiber, which we see right here, and when that muscle fiber actually begins to shorten or contract. And that time period or delay is known as the latent period. The reason for the latent period has everything to do with this slide. That is to say, the cell starts to become excited right up here, but that depolarization event has to spread down the T-tubule, cause a conformational change in the DHP receptor, open the ryanidine channel, allow calcium to move down its gradients, bind to troponin, troponin needs to move tropomyosin, myosin head needs to grab the thin filaments, and then we get the sliding of the filaments, which is muscle contraction. So ultimately, there's just a lot of steps that need to occur between the initial excitation and the actual mechanical event, the movement of the muscle fiber. Another thing I want to talk about are the uses of ATP in contracting muscle. There are three uses in skeletal muscle. One is the sodium-potassium pump, which we've talked about at length in different cells in our body. The sodium-potassium pump in skeletal muscle fibers to serve the same purposes it does in all cells. That is to say, restore chemical gradients, maintain the electrical voltage, maintain the cell volume of the cell. We also have a calcium pump, which pumps calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum against its gradient. Keep in mind, there's still a lot more calcium, which we see as these yellow circles here. There's always going to be more calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum than in the sarcoplasm, in the interior of the cell. As a result, energy is required, a pump is required to move calcium back into this organelle. So we use ATP for the sodium potassium pump. We also use it for the calcium pump. Now for the actual myofilaments, ATP is used. Hydrolysis of ATP, that is to say the breaking apart of ATP into ADP and an inorganic phosphate releases energy. And that energy is harnessed to allow for contraction of the muscle fiber. But the ATP molecule itself, when it binds to the myosin head, will actually cause the muscle to relax. So it's the hydrolysis that allows for the contraction of the muscle fiber, and it's the binding of the intact ATP molecule that allows for muscle relaxation. So we need ATP for the activity and relaxation of the myofilaments. We need ATP as the chemical energy to drive this calcium pump, 
and we also need ATP as the energy source for the sodium potassium pump. 